Welcome to This Week in Intelligent Investing, where we examine timely and timeless investment topics to help you become a better investor. Enjoy authentic, unscripted discussion featuring Chris Bloomstrand, Phil Ordway, Elliot Turner, and other thought-leading investors. Brought to you by MOI Global. And now, here is your host, John Mihaljevic. Welcome, everybody, to another episode of This Week in Intelligent Investing. We have a great episode ahead. Uh, the crew is back together this week with uh, Elliot Turner, Chris Bloomstrand, and Phil Ordway all uh, joining us and ready with discussion topics for today. Elliot, I know you have an interesting quote that you wanted to read and uh, have that serve as our discussion starter. So please go ahead. Great. Thank you, John. And uh, great job last week holding holding for it while we were gone, Phil. That interview with uh, Larry Cunningham was just really awesome and fascinating. So it's good to be back. Glad to be back in the saddle. And um, wanted to launch into a conversation around a quote from Nick Sleep's uh, letter collection that I was introduced to that I find really interesting and timely. Um, and I have a few questions that I've been thinking about a lot with respect to this. Um, and these are some themes that I've been intrigued by for quite a while, have invested around some of them, though I had never been familiar with this quote. And I think it really hit me as quite stark and something I, I wish I'd been exposed to earlier. Um, and it's a framework I wish I'd thought about sooner. Uh, but anyway, here goes. So the quote is, if Frank Capra is right that a hunch is creativity trying to tell you something then our hunch is that the growth rate in online retailing is held back by consumers' psychological biases. We are all creatures of habit, and most of us give up comfort blankets quite reluctantly. It therefore takes time for a new regime to be adopted and, for instance, to buy books online instead of buying them at the local store. Perhaps then, after we have become comfortable with buying books online, we may experiment with something else, trainers say, or magazine subscriptions, or plant pots, or bike saddles, or grocery. The process requires a good retail experience, price convenience selection, the building of trust, and is often fanned with personal recommendations, social proof, and even bragging rights for the early adopters. The process is more of a drift than epiphany. Our hunch is that the growth rate in online retailing is regulated not by physical capacity, although that can be a limiting factor, but more by the rate at which our own incumbent habits and associations are replaced with more rational behavior. So this was Nick Sleep writing about his investment in Amazon in the aughts of the decade, in the mid-2000, uh, like 2005 period, somewhere around there. Don't quote me on the exact date. But, you know, was, Sleep was, a, was early to understand the power of Amazon the opportunity to change consumer behavior and extend the core business well beyond where they started in books. And he stuck through with that investment for over a decade, uh, generating phenomenal returns along the way. So why is this relevant today? Why is this interesting? Well, you know, if, if the limiting factor was not uh, physical capacity, but rather our behavior, um, COVID and the uh, corresponding lockdowns have been the ultimate catalyst to change our behavior by necessity. So it doesn't take a bitter experience even. Uh, it, it, it was effectively a mandate that we experiment and try new kinds of shopping. And so I think you know many people have become less reluctant to buy things online over the past few years, but like the acceleration has been phenomenal since COVID. And then I think even within the online world, uh, Amazon had done such a great job of shaping our behavior to buy things on Amazon. But more recently, you know, Amazon hit physical capacity limitations on what they were able to deliver on. So I found myself ordering a whole lot more from uh, whether it be Walmart uh, for household consumables or Dick's Sporting Goods, where we got like rollerblades for the little ones, uh, hockey sticks, stuff like that to uh, you know, just about a anything else. I've really broadened my scope there. Um, and so I've been researching a lot of companies who I think, on the one hand, there's some companies who are COVID beneficiaries, but their 
the, the, the change they're experiencing isn't going to be enduring. It's like a one-time boost. But because of these behavior changes, I think there are a lot of companies where the, the change is going to be permanent and they've brought them to, they, they've, these companies have acquired customers who are going to be really high value for a very long time. So I wanted to open this up for a discussion and see how this quote resonates with you guys, what you think right now, and, and how you think about the, the general transition of the world from physical to digital. I think it's spot on. It it struck me in two ways in the news right now. I think one is that you look at the postal service, at least in the US, and the chaos happening there and the amount of first class mail we still have. I think if you had told a lot of people 20 years ago how online everything would explode, they would have assumed the postal service would still exist, maybe, but barely. And instead, I mean it's it's clearly declined, but it's still massive because a lot of people, myself included, still use paper mail for certain things. And I think those habits die very slowly. I mean, it's a comfort or it's a ingrained habit. It's just like, uh, you know, the old saying about progress in, in physics or the hard sciences progressing one funeral at a time. I think the same applies here. So I, I think it's absolutely spot on. Yeah, my observation is the, is the rapidity and speed at which disruption is taking place. And, and this disruption by the COVID exacerbates that. You know, I think changes that we're going to evolve over a three or four or five year period of time are being compressed into a six month to a 12 month horizon. I mean, you know, I've spent a career watching disruption. And in the early days, you, know, you watch the downtown department stores, the Woolworths and what have you, and the Sears kind of morph to where mom and pop stores were replaced ultimately by Walmart, and then Walmart itself was displaced by Amazon. And you know th- th- these things happened over periods of decades and then years. And you know now you're seeing disruption in a whole bunch of industries, um, you know, happening in nanoseconds. You know, you've got you know big manufacturers and and you know companies trying to figure out and solve the distribution riddle. Nike, for example, which we own a little bit of, you know, has really done a good job selling direct to their customers. You know, they've realized that kind of the bricks and mortar retail, you know, is is, is still their, their their primary distribution network, but you, know, you won't find Nike's product on Amazon. Um, and, you know, they've got enough scale to do this. Then you've got other retailers that are going to lean on Shopify and trying to solve payment systems. But it's remarkable to see the change and to see the degree to which companies are penalized for being behind the curve or rewarded for getting ahead of the curve, you know, certainly in terms of market share, but also in terms of market prices for the publicly traded companies. You know, we've got position in Richemont, which is a wonderful business run by the Rupert family, um, headquartered in Switzerland, luxury goods. You guys, I'm sure all know it. You know, in jewelry, they have um, Cartier and Van Cleef and Arpels. They've got a bunch of high-end uh, watch brands, Vacheron Constantine, you know, at the highest and they've been over the last couple three years trying to solve, you know, distribution. You know, in Richemont's case, um, you know, the last thing you want to see if you're selling luxury goods is is your goods sold in the gray market at a discount. If somebody comes into one of your stores and buys a watch, let's say for fifty thousand dollars, you don't want to see that watch sold online two weeks later for thirty thousand dollars. And so, you know, maintaining control of distribution and maintaining control of brand is such an important thing, but. In the most recent period, their sales were off 50% because they're still store based and the Chinese aren't traveling. And so, you know, they own Watchfinder and they've got Ukes Net a Porte. Uh, and, you know, they've got plans in place to increase online distribution and that whole process of shopping. I think if you're a Chinese shopper, you know, you love the concept of traveling to London or to Paris or to New York or to Hong Kong or Macau. And, and not buying your goods in, in China. Uh, the Chinese shopper will tell you that just the level of customer service is greater when you get out of China. The awareness of the brands and the history of the brands is greater with the sales representatives. But you know, if, if we're not traveling, um, you know, sales are still taking place. And if you don't have the whole online shopping experience, you know, if you if you if you want to go shop and learn about a Vacheron watch, you better have a great website. And uh, you know, it better be just as shoppable you know, they're on the website as it is, you know, walking into the New York store. So, you know, the conclusion I draw is, is wow, um, change is happening faster than I ever would have thought it would have taken place. And it makes our jobs as investors that much more difficult. I'm curious, um, 
how you guys think this quote would apply, <clears throat> excuse me, would apply today, because clearly in the e-commerce area, it's obvious that we've gotten comfortable with online shopping and so forth. But I go back to a quote, I think, by um, Jim Chanos back in the day when Blockbuster was still fighting Netflix. And he said, anything that can be digitized will be digitized. And do you guys think that if you applied the Nick Sleep quote broadly today, that it could apply to financial services? I mean, ultimately, banking is digital. It's a commodity. You're it's about money um, and so forth. And if you have a really good financial app or a banking app on your phone, like a Revolut out of the UK, you know, why would 10 years from now an average consumer care what bank is behind that app? You know, if the app is super convenient, gives them what they want. Why wouldn't deposits just kind of get sucked up from the banks that we know today, the brick and mortar banks, and just go into those apps? And what would that mean for the banking system? I'll take that one because I've spent a lot of time thinking about it as we've owned banks over the years. And I think you're largely correct. And I think you can look to Ally Financial in the US as an example of that, where in their GMAC prior life, they didn't exactly have the best name or reputation. They slap a new kind of androgynous label on it. And the online banking product there has been wildly successful. And now you've seen other companies try to take that on and and copy that. And I think they'll probably be largely successful. I will say to part of your question, though, I don't know that you could completely ignore who's behind it. Allies also executed reasonably well. They haven't had any Big failures. I mean, you have to earn and keep that trust. I mean, certainly with somebody's money. So just because you have a good user interface, I don't think will be sufficient. But I think your point stands that um, a commodity business could be even more commodified, um, if that's a word. And I think you'll also see that, like you said, the, the continued digitization of it. I, I guess the limiting factor on it for me would be there are still some transactions, even if you're not a grumpy old man where you want some human, even some face-to-face interactions. But I think you'll see that approach the asymptote of very, very few. And it, it gets down to some finer points about rural versus urban and, you know, where that can really be taken to the extremes. But certainly, you know, fewer physical branches, bricks and mortar, fewer in-person transactions. But there again, I mean, I think if you told somebody 20 years ago, just like with the postal service, a lot of Techno optimists would assume the postal service would just go away. I think if you told somebody 20 years ago about the changes you've seen in digital banking, you know, whether it's the iPhone or even cryptocurrencies, everyone would just sort of assume there'd be no such thing as a physical bank branch. There'd be no no such thing as a as a bank teller anymore or even an ATM, let alone physical currency. But certainly you still have all that in spades. Um, physical currency is actually still very much a part of our economy. There's actually a coin shortage in the United States right now in coins in circulation and even some physical denominations like the $100 bill have actually been increasing at a rate ahead of GDP growth for the last several years. Um, So I would say that so long as we have physical currency, so long as we have these broad suite of services that are handled by financial institutions and banks, that will, whatever level of activity that is as a share of the overall economic picture will be kind of the limiting factor as to how far you can go on digitizing all that. But that means you have a massive runway in front of you. And I certainly agree with the overall direction that that's headed. Yeah, I want to chime in on this too, because it's something I've thought about a lot. I um, presented PayPal twice now at MOI conferences. And, uh, you know, it's an area that, it, you know, we've invested a lot behind and um, really compelled by the thesis in general. Um, Dan Schulman, when he first became PayPal CEO, laid out this vision that you can look for areas in financial services in particular where fees are especially high. Use the uh, scale and power of technology to kind of spread those fees over a much larger customer base and drive down fees in all those areas and lead the commodification of some of these processes. And interestingly, I really felt until more recently that PayPal had under-delivered on this vision and promise 
And it was actually Square who came in building a digital wallet um, with the Cash App and layering on direct deposit, which tied to their payroll services, portfolio capabilities that started first with Bitcoin and then stocks and then fractional uh, share purchases of stocks and getting deeper into every layer of banking and creating effectively like a bank account in an app. And with COVID, both these companies have accelerated meaningfully. They've got far more engagement from their customer base um, on the payment side and more traction with, with layering on these extra services. So I think there's really you know, no industry that's totally immune to the forces of technology here. Um, and I've seen some banks lead better efforts than others, but uh, it's interesting to think about how both sides could kind of converge towards this, like, I don't know, almost utopian vision of everything working through your phone. It's it, it's really powerful. And, you know, I think PayPal has recently understood how effective Square has been on this front and realized they needed to step up their own efforts and they're doing things that are more proactive um, and kind of using Venmo too as, as as a platform to be a little more experimental and take advantage of the higher engagement that younger generations have anyway in in the payment space to to use a little more of a white space and blank canvas to try out and and see what they could pull away from the traditional banking uh, industry. So I you know I, I think that's a great point, John. I think it's really interesting, really compelling, and I do think that. You know, as people have built trust, like talk about PayPal and to bring it back to e commerce, like without something like PayPal, I don't think you could have gotten as much trust and traction in e commerce. And I don't think you could have necessarily had this sort of step change that we're experiencing today because who wants to type in a random site and just give them your payment credentials and just leave that flying around everywhere on the internet when sites could get hacked? Um, so centralizing it is a way to kind of leave your trust in one place whose core essence is about protecting that trust. Um, so I think it's a really, really important area. Yeah, just one observation here. I think the banks were probably a decade late in in the notion that, that you did not need a physical branch bank network to attract deposits. Um, you know, the peak there would have been, oh, I don't know, 85 or 90,000 branches in the United States, maybe in 08 or 09, and you're probably down by 10 or 15,000. Uh, branch unit since then, but you know, the, the the runway to me is still really long. You got so much more business that rides on the Mastercard and Visa networks, depending on you know, it, it, regardless of of kind of what the front end of that looks like, and still an enormous amount of uh, business activity is done internationally in cash, and so you know we're we're only in the early innings of the trend toward digitization, but uh, you know I think at the end of the day. Um, What's going to be interesting, and it's not really a subject for, it shouldn't be a subject for this this discussion today, but uh, if we do run into problems with the acceptance of fiat currency, uh, given the the level of debt in society, you mentioned the coin shortage. I can't can't recall the last time A, I was in a a branch of a bank, uh, and I can't recall the last time I used cash for any transaction. You know, I'd live on the credit card paid monthly and live on the reward points that come with the, you know, the Costco card and the various other cards that I carry. And I try to maximize where I'm eating at restaurants and where I'm getting gas for the 5% back and the 4% back and the 1% back. So long runway to me, but with one caveat is, um, um, yeah, I, I, I'll go back to my gold discussion from a few weeks ago. I, I think we're going to have issues with fiat currency at some point in my lifetime. And you know, what happens on that front with digitization? Do you get a big pause and you know, a, a, a sudden demand for, for currency? But, you know, that's kind of a point out on the, the stratosphere. It's funny you mentioned reward points in there because um, I've heard this phrase that like reward points are the new interest in the world of ZERP where you're compensated by banks for what you spend as opposed to what you deposit with them. Um, and I just always found that I, I found that kind of funny in recent years, and we're back to that world yet again. Um, but I wonder what you guys think of how sustainable some of this uh, acceleration in e-com is. Like, do you view this as a to use Fisher's uh, really wrong but old quote about a permanently high plateau? Is this a permanently high plateau from which we're going to grow in e-commerce, or do you think 
some of this behavior is going to revert back to more traditional channels? And how do you think that breaks down by industry or like subsector of, of commerce? Yeah, I think the vast majority of it will stick. I think it, for all intents and purposes, is a permanently high plateau. I think just changes that were coming in the future were pulled forward to now. I mean, you'll give some of it back here and there, but the overall trajectory, I think, was inarguably higher over time and this pulled it all forward. So even if you have a little dip, you know, the the overall direction is is still enormously positive. I think your question, the second part of the question is maybe the more important one, which is who are the winners and losers in there? And I think that's a much, much harder question. And one framework I've been using to kind of diagnose that is just the convenience factor almost, right? I mean, it's just, that's part of why Amazon has prospered so much. And it's probably the one and only drawback I have personally in in considering something like Costco is it's just that most people, not all people, most people dislike going shopping. Uh, some people like the treasure hunt. Some people like going out in the, you know, the physical interaction, the serendipity. I would say most people probably don't. I'm certainly one of those people. I don't really enjoy that part of it. So if it's something you dislike doing that you've now stopped doing physically and started doing digitally, I think that'll probably be the the stickiest area. It's to me, we're very early innings still, certainly for the broad swath of retail. But you know, I'll go back to my Richemont example. If you're a customer in the market for a hundred thousand dollar piece of jewelry from a Cartier or from a Van Cleef or a watch at, at the same price point, you got to have your online distribution, you've got to have your website uh, to where the consumer can, can do essentially all of the shopping. But there are places where you're just not going to get away from the retail experience. I mean, I, I don't, I, 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 I don't see the very, very high end of luxury being purchased online anytime soon. So, I, so there are nuances. But if you're a baseline retailer in the malls of America, you've got a pretty limited shelf life. And again, you've taken the disruption that was going to take place over the next five to ten years and compressed it into a very short period of time. A lot of brick and mortars are, are, are going to be gone when we deal with the over-leveraged, over-leased, uh, over-built square footage, certainly in retail. And I think the next two years, you know, year to two years, especially when the Fed tries to extricate themselves from the system and begins, if they can, removing liquidity supports, we're in for a long, drawn-out um, you know, credit workout. And you know, a lot of that's concentrated in retail for sure. Yeah, Morgan Stanley does this annual survey of their interns at the end of the summer on emergent trends um, to see what is and is not getting traction. One of the areas I found especially interesting where people still have a, a predisposition to shop at brick and mortar, if I recall off the top of my head, it was like 65% of their interns preferred to buy apparel in store which kind of makes sense because when you're shopping online, both the curation, the return process, sizing, fitting, and you know, seeing things and feeling them as opposed to just like viewing a picture and hitting buy. Uh, but just about everything else, it does feel like this is a meaningful change and people are far more willing to try things online, to try subscriptions, to change their... to take direct deposit in an app. Um, and I, you know, it's hard to think about how we go back, but then I wonder like, what does that mean for the amount of physical uh, infrastructure we have dedicated to, to the real world? And how do you like transform things from here? Like how much investment and loss will there be along the way? I uh, wonder, have you guys been thinking about that, looking at that? Much investment and loss in what specifically? The existing physical infrastructure. Uh, oh, oh, sure. Yes, yeah, yeah. stores, uh, the logistics to to get product to stores, everything. I guess I would say I've been thinking about it to the extent that I know enough to be terrified, and I wouldn't. I mean, I don't short anything, and uh, it's certainly just not an area that I would spend much time bargain hunting for, because I think it's going to be so hard in that space to, to do a lot. I mean, I think there's room probably for a few experts to go bottom fishing and find some baby thrown out with the bathwater kind of opportunities. But yeah, I think there's going to be a massive reshuffling of physical infrastructure in that world. And you see it every day driving down the street with the amount of new distribution and warehouse facilities and strip malls and movie theaters and physical retail of all kind being, you know, emptied and transformed you know, in real time. I think it's going to continue almost unabated for years. 
you know, a personal observation, I can tell you that that my daughter, uh, 19 years old now, you know, when she was in the market for prom dresses and graduation dresses and just a lot of the clothes that she wears, she would never set foot in a in a retail store. She'll use the stitch fixes, st- stitch fixes, and there are a couple three others where you know you'll buy four dresses, try them on, send three back at no cost. Um, you know, I think there is a there's there's well this this younger generation is just increasingly not going to set foot in retail. But then you know, you I, there, there's no displacement of the Costco's of the world, the Dollar Generals of the world. So it's it's nuanced. But the younger you get, the I think the less you're going to lean on on ever leaving the house when it comes to shopping for a lot of your your base consumer goods. One other point that I think Isaac Schwartz of Roboti and Company made at uh, Idea Week was that you're still going to have spaces that consumers go to, but they're not going to be the kinds of stores that you see today. They're going to be more about experience and about building the brand. So instead of having a small Nike store in every little mall to sell shoes or apparel, you might get in one huge mall or one huge space, like a full-size basketball court, where Nike is basically just branding and it's about, you know, what it wants the brand to mean in people's minds, but all of the actual transacting will take place online. Yeah, Isaac's presentation was fascinating. Going from there too, to like what it would look like for um, food, for grocery delivery and the three different ways that you could approach that. I think he'd be an interesting person to talk to about some of these things, but that's another area, right? Like um, just today, we got a delivery from this uh, farm share service we use. Formerly, what they would do is they worked with our daycare, Bright Horizons, and they had a daily drop-off at Bright Horizons. So we'd have to get our order in by Sunday night and every Wednesday uh, when we'd pick up our our daughters from Bright Horizons, the box would be there. Um, with COVID, they did a test run in like a few zip codes, delivering their product to houses directly. And it's taken off so much that they've started <laughs> growing their entire offering. The amount, the amount of product they offer, they built a much better website. And they actually started doing... You know, Phil mentioned the post office early. Interestingly, I keep hearing this from e-com companies, but direct mail flyers are one of the best, uh, you know, return on ad spends you could get. Go figure, right? For yeah, for no, they still work. No, that's true. They do still work. It's amazing. Yeah, phenomenally well. So they're you know papering the whole neighborhood with these direct mail flyers, and I hear more and more people like converting, and you know, I can only imagine what the unit economics of something like that have looked like. Though that was a business that I don't think they could have tried to pursue before, but the the change happened so fast and the surplus earnings so extreme early on that they... I, my understanding is they were able to invest in it and self-finance it themselves without bringing on anyone else. So really interesting to think about this kind of stuff. One other point I'd make too, Elliot, which I think was really interesting that you brought up was the the concept of reward points. And and Chris, you mentioned it too. And And scenario I've spent a lot of time thinking about not only because I have the same Costco card you do, Chris. I love Costco as much as anybody. And and that is a great way to kind of organize your spending. Although I do still use cash and occasionally maybe one or two bank visits a year. But you look at reward points, I mean they've been around forever, right? I mean, it, you know, in this concept of of getting a reward is really, really old. And it's just a classic marketing ploy. And you look at one area that in my opinion is still ripe to be changed. And, it, and it's maybe this one because whether it's legislation and regulatory change on the interchange fee level, I mean, that's basically what the reward points are doing, right? They're basically trying to encourage you to spend more money in a certain channel so that the various parties involved can up the interchange fees and keep it away from everybody else. And they'll give you back a tiny sliver of that. And it's just an enormously inefficient system. Now, it comes with lots of benefits and I'm not dismissive of those benefits maybe at the very top of that list is just how much trust and protection is built into the system. So, you know, if you use cash, that actually has a lot of benefits too. And I'm still quite skeptical of the overall value of cryptocurrencies as a store of value and a use of a medium of transaction and, and cash and credit cards both have their their places in that. But if you look at the way the credit card system is is set up today, I mean, you have zero interest rates, as you pointed out, and basically all-time high 
APRs on balances. And without that, the credit card companies have a hard time making that work. And it, it, you know, th- and this actually predates even the current crisis, right? I mean, what really opened my eyes to this was when Costco again actually came to the forefront um, and kicked out American Express after a couple of decades and gave all that business to Citibank and Visa. It basically has zero percent margin to them on the Costco piece as a merchant, and that because the rest of the charge volume that comes on the Costco card is so valuable to City and Visa, they were willing to take that take that hit, and it made all the sense for City and Visa to do that, and so. It just strikes me as an area where um, I don't think it's going to change tomorrow. I don't think it's going to change this year, maybe even this decade. But you know, the longer it goes on, I think the more um, you have to be at least somewhat cognizant of the risk for change. Just one other thought on how the Nick Sleep quote might apply today. And I'm curious if you guys have a view on this, but I've been thinking about sort of what are the areas where it's hard to imagine a much greater adoption, but it might go that way. And one area I'm seeing is gaming and in-app purchases. I mean, some years ago, I thought that was the dumbest thing to exchange real cash for fake cash within a game. But now I'm actually seeing with my kids, they would rather get in-app purchases versus real toys. And uh, that's one area where with some imagination, you could actually see people consuming a lot more digital goods through gaming than real goods uh, because those games end up being the new malls where the kids or teenagers hang out and they want to be seen as uh, you know doing really well in those spaces. Do you guys have a take on that? Yeah, I find that also interesting. It's something I've been following from afar, but trying to pull myself closer to as uh, time goes on. Um, it's been really interesting seeing the willingness of people to engage. It's something that, like, on the surface, you view I view as ephemeral, but then you get to thinking about how younger generations are more into experiential spend. And how you want to be authentic and develop and forge a unique personality online. And like some of these alternate realities are both like an escape and and an end and immersion at the same time. And I think it's uh, something that, you know, you keep seeing happen in, in more and more forums in the gaming world. Like we have a position in Nintendo and I've been watching Animal Crossing and seeing the ways that different companies are trying to engage there too. So there's an opportunity on both sides of things for the gaming companies, for payment companies, and for like traditional brick and mortar companies to kind of push their identity online too and kind of shape their own um, unique persona for, for each of these areas. I think it's going to continue to happen. And there's no going back from something like this. Even like obviously engagement levels are going to be much higher during stay at home orders than um, when those are off. But like the behavior is quite both addicting and compelling. So yeah, I I think that's really something to follow. I'm probably the wrong guy to ask the question of John in that when my wife and I walk the dog, I, I think we've got a tremendous problem in that I never see kids at the elementary school or the middle school basketball court or the baseball diamond or the soccer field, you know, unless they're playing an organized activity with an organized coach. Um, So I'll leave my comment at that. All right. Well, let's switch uh, gears and go to you, Chris, uh, for your topic today. Well, good. So I was going to talk about uh, just uh, an observation of uh, the evolution of kind of the, the classic money market fund within the brokerage environment. But given that Dow Jones in all their infinite wisdom is out with a series of changes to the the venerable Dow Jones industrial average, I, I had a, I thought it'd be fun to have a couple quick observations. I didn't tell you guys I would mention this. and I, I hadn't intended to, but a, a friend of mine asked me yesterday, when did Intel and Microsoft go in the index? And I said, you know, it was damn near right at the top. And turns out November 99, Intel and Microsoft were put in. Uh, at the same time, Home Depot and Southwestern Bell went in. Well, Home Depot was flat to down until 2012. Uh, Microsoft was a negative return for 15 years. Intel was a negative return for a long time. SBC, uh, now AT&T, is probably negative 
even since 1999. Coming out of the index at that time was Chevron. So it's really interesting that Exxon is now being yanked out, Chevron being the last of the energy businesses. The energy component in the index is, is very low. Just a cursory glance at, at when companies have gone in and out of the Dow. And you can make the same case at some level for the S&P 500, which I've spent a lot more time kind of analyzing over the years, especially in the context of passive flows and uh, you know, just the pervasive outperformance in the last decade. But it, it, interesting that Chevron was pulled out of the index at the same time Intel Microsoft went in. And the stock, you know, damn near immediately doubled, you know, came out late 99, uh, very end of 98. It was a brutal energy bear market, not unlike today's. Uh, oil traded down to 10 bucks a barrel. The world thought it was going to five. So they pulled Chevron out. They actually put it back in in February of 08. So it spent eight years in the penalty box. They put it back in damn near at the all-time high, proceeded to drop 40 or 50%. Just, just the history of when they're moving in and out is, is really odd and interesting. AIG went in in April of 04, essentially failed four years later. Receivership, Bank of America went in in February of 08, came out in September of 13. So, the, so this latest series of changes, and you know, some of which I think I spend zero time thinking about the Dow in, in that running a price-weighted index still just makes no sense. It's not cap-weighted. You guys know that. We talked about the stock splits at Apple and at Tesla over the last uh, handful of episodes. It, it's interesting that with the three companies going in, Salesforce, Amgen, and Honeywell, versus the three coming out, Exxon, Pfizer, oh, what else is coming out? Um, uh, I'll, I'll think of it. Uh, but, but Salesforce, Amgen, Honeywell are all you know, $100, $200 plus stocks. You know, Pfizer's $38 or $39. Bucks. Exxon's right at $40 per share. God, I forget what else is coming out. In any event, um, Raytheon, I, I, Raytheon, exactly. Raytheon, probably. I don't know, sixty-five bucks, sixty bucks, something like that. In any event, you know, price weighted. I wonder. I wonder if the split in Apple, which really was probably the best move the people at Dow Jones made, putting it in in, I'm going to say March or June of 2015, stock is probably up three or four x since then. Um, AT and T is the one that came out at that time. I wonder if, if, if because Apple's now splitting and it's still a price-weighted index, obviously the impact of Apple on the index will be diminished now pretty greatly by the split. I wonder if they were trying to replace more of a high flyer, you know, a sales force at 270 bucks a share, albeit trading at 10 times sales. I wonder how much of that was predicated on the Apple split. The timing of Exxon is really amazing to me. It's the longest now tenured member of the S&P. We own the stock. You know they've got some capital allocation issues, but you know I've, I, I, you know I'm sitting here watching the the decline in the virus. Uh, you know hopefully we get the economy uh, back running. I think hopefully get kids back in school. You know, the number of miles driven, the the use of energy, ought to recover when we really start to uh, lean back on industrial production. And I wonder if they're they're not just making the same type decisions that they made in November '99, yanking energy out at the very lows in energy and putting in kind of some tech type high flyers at, at, at what winds up being the peak. Anyhow, uh, we, we can circle back on that, but I thought it would be fun and maybe we can you guys have some thoughts on that. But, but, the, but the thing I really wanted to talk about has been this observation, you know, having been an investor for 30 years and having used as our custodians and brokers, myriad firms, bo it bothers me what happened in the financial crisis in that when we all had our brokerage accounts, be they you know, retail or institutional, classically, you would sweep your cash deposits, your dividends into money market funds. Your money was swept into money funds. And you know, pretty classically for a long time, the fees in those funds averaged about 50 basis points. You had different share classes, you know, some of your more retail-oriented funds. And if you had smaller deposit balances, your, your fees could even trend up toward 100 plus basis points, which is kind of insane to run a money fund. So you got to the financial crisis and we took interest rates to zero. And all of a sudden, you know, with, with T-bill rates at nothing, you know, a government fund had no yield. And yet, you know, you were the, the, the manager of a fund or the sponsor of a fund and, you know, theoretically supposed to be collecting 50 basis points. If you would have collected 50 basis points on, let's say, a 10 basis point you know, top line yield, 
the underlying return to your your investor uh, would have been negative 40 basis points. So you wound up with wholesale subsidies of the fund, fund complex. And at a point, all of these brokerage firms, from the discount brokers to the mainline Wall Street brokers, all of a sudden, just kind of just in a row, flip to where they mandated that that money would sweep into a bank. So Schwab started a bank. TD was obviously a bank. They've all got banks. Um, you know, the big money centers all have banks. And so now you've been compelled. I mean, you don't even have an option. You're compelled to sweep into a bank where you've got $250,000 FDIC limits in today's world of zero interest rates, zero to 25 on Fed funds, you know, T-bill rates are single digit. A couple of three weeks ago, they were, you know, 18, 19 basis points. So, so, so you're sitting here in a bank sweep to the extent you've had any yield in the last five years. You know, you go back two years ago when we actually had real interest rates and T-bills were two and a half percent. I mean, Schwab, for example, had a net interest margin of almost two and a half percent at the peak in first quarter of 19. Well, the depositor, the the retail brokerage client earned very little of that. So, you know, Schwab would buy bills and agency securities, short paper, and, and, and they would effectively run the difference. Well, if you would have had the old classic money market fund structure with a 50 basis point fee and you were earning two and a half points on T-bills, let's say, the investor would have had a 2% spread. So the problem I have with the whole structure is I think I find it entirely immoral. Um, you know, I think the notion that the Fed has said they're going to keep rates, short rates at zero for five years, you know, my bet would be infinitely longer than five. I don't think given the level of debt we have in our system, that our system can bear uh, a normalized yield curve. Um, you know, anything remotely close to what we would have experienced at, at, at past points in our career. And so it's interesting. All, all these discount brokers and even the main lines have cut their commissions to effectively zero. Uh, fees on the money funds are now, you know, anywhere from, you know, 11 basis points. You still have some that are still oddly above 100 basis points, which is incredible. They're all under waivers today because, again, you can't charge, you know, a big management fee to run a money fund when your investment universe is, is lower yields. So it was, it was odd. When when Schwab merged with TD, um, you know, and, and, and right around that time, they cut their commission rates to zero. So you've got zero commissions on common stocks. You pay at most of these places 65 cents per option contract. They make money on margin to the extent investors are, are leaning on, on, on margin. And, and those rates range across the, the universe of these brokers from four to let's say nine and a half percent. You wind up paying progressively less interest on margin debt, uh, the larger the margin balance. So, you know, you get up to 500,000 or a million dollars, your margin rates start pushing down to, you know, anywhere from four to 6%, depending on the house that you're dealing with. Um, but the Schwab CFO, and, I, and I'm sitting here thinking about my business, and we have a number of clients that, that use Schwab as their custodian and as their broker. Um, so we're not paying commissions. You know, we don't run accounts on margin. And you start thinking, well, how the hell do these guys make money? Well, a couple of weeks ago, we talked about payment for order flow, which is still substantial. And Schwab's CFO effectively said, well, you know, wink, wink, you know, we still get played penny, but, but paid plenty for selling order flow. And so, you know, all of these guys do. I think the one exception is, is we just went through and I kind of worked up kind of what the terms had had, had had evolved to in terms of fees on money funds. So looked at Schwab, TD, Fidelity, E-Trade, Interactive Brokers, Robinhood, and Vanguard. You know, the, the, the gem that leaps out of me, and I wouldn't want to do a commercial for Vanguard. We don't do any business with them at present, but they don't sell order flow. Uh, you can still sweep to their federal money market fund, which has, you know, a modest 11 basis point management fee being waived today, of course, because T-bill rates are lower. You know, typically across the, the complex of Vanguard's money funds, you've got one to 12 type basis point yields. So you've actually still got some positive yield as a depositor. But the, the problem I have is if, if you're the unwitting retail investor and you're being compelled to sweep to a money fund, presume you don't have the $250,000 FDIC concerns, which if you're a larger investor, you need to be really careful about account titling. Husband and wife, for instance, can pool. And if you get the account titling right, you can you can get up to your five hundred thousand dollars of protection. If you get your kids titled right, you can exceed those FDIC thresholds. But if you're a retail investor, 
and you're going to lay around any level of cash. Most of these folks are unwitting. And so, you know, the I don't know who our audience is, guys and John on the podcast, but if you're a retail investor and you're being swept into a money fund, today may not be the time to worry about it. Uh, you know, I would say, you know, obviously you can go out and buy T-bills, which we do. You know, we're up every morning with our clients to the extent we have client cash. You know, we're not into paying fees and money market funds. We're certainly not into letting the house keep the net, the net interest margin spread when I can go buy the same securities that they're going to buy. But, you know, if we evolve ever back to the point where we have real interest rates, I mean, it's incumbent upon investors to realize that we're being robbed of our savings. We're being robbed of our savings with what are going to be very low interest rates for a very long time. You know, I, I think even the Fed and, and central banks are going to push on the long end of the curve to the extent the Fed can lengthen, you know, the treasury's borrowing. We'll be buying a lot more long dated paper, um, but you know, at, at some level, I think the whole the whole evolution of the brokerage and money industry has been fairly immoral, and bothers me to no end. The day we were compelled to sweep to a bank, had no option, and now physically have to go out and make a trade to physically buy a money market fund or buy a T bill, and. I'm just not sure how many retail investors, I'm not sure how many of the, the young folks investing on Robinhood's platform realize the degree to which Robinhood makes incredibly rich margins on payment for order flow. I mean, you know, their, their order flow business payments are 10x what a Schwab or what a TD would collect. And it's not insignificant. It's 2 or 3% of Schwab's revenues, but it's, it's over half of Robinhood's revenues. There's just a lot of hidden costs and you know, burdens. When, when you think you've got zero commissions and the cost of trading is free, no, it's not free. I mean, you know, this, the wholesale broker, the Citadels, the Virtues, the Wolverines are effectively making the bid-ass spread. And I would say, you know, if you go back pre-decimalization, um, you know, when stocks traded in eighths and quarters, you know, it, the, the whole concept of, of moving to a decimalized platform was to lower bid-ass spreads. I would argue that as payment for order flow grew and grew, and even in the last year, I mean, you look at the, the, the dollar revenues that the discount brokers are raking in from payment for order flow, I mean, they're, they're up you know, 40, 50, 100%, 300% year over year versus 2019. Some of that's on the increase in the absolute number of brokerage accounts and the number of individual retail investors that are trading. You know, that's one of the byproducts of this, this, this COVID downturn is you know, we wound up subsidizing households that were unemployed, paying them more to not work than they were working. And so a lot of that, that incremental cash has found its way into the Robinhood world. But to me, it's a buyer beware world. And, and you know, these guys are shaving pennies and nickels uh, and, and, and you add it up and it's not an insignificant sum. And I don't think enough investors come into their capital oriented investment processes with a genuine understanding that, you know, if you buy a good business and own it for a long time and you keep all of these frictional costs, a lot of which, which used to be way more above board and transparent, you know, back in the day when we'd pay Schwab $39 per trade and plus X number of cents per commission, well, now it's zero, but I guarantee you their payment for order flow is a lot higher. And I think bid-ass spreads, despite this, you know, these massive flows into the stock market, I would bet you that bid ass spreads are even higher today. So, you know, there's a lot of unseen costs that absolutely eat away from return. And if you're manically turning over your portfolio and buying and selling and buying and selling, you're doing yourself a lot of a lot of disservice. And for the the long the long term investor that's you know mom and pop that that are going to you know buy their mutual funds or buy a Berkshire Hathaway and sit on it for you know a long time. You still have to be careful of your of your of your bank sweeps, and you've got to be aware that you're sitting in a bank now, and you're not sitting in a money market fund. So, you know, I'll stop blathering on um, because I, I go off on tangents. But it's a thing that's bothered me, and I thought the, the the retail world that might be listening into us, you know, might might benefit from the notion of of what's happened evolutionary over you know the last two or three decades. I want to take it in parts because I think there's so many pieces of that, and I I agree with the overall direction for sure, although I'll push back and play devil's advocate on a few pieces of it. But to clarify, I think the main crux of it too, I know it's true at Interactive. I'm almost positive it's true at Schwab. Isn't it true at almost every broker that you can, in fact, opt out of the mandatory sweep? Inter I, inter interactive, um, 
partners with banks. We've got a couple clients that use interactive. Um, yeah, I use them, and you can you can absolutely opt out for sure. At Schwab and TD, it's the at Schwab you can't. Schwab you go to their bank, but you could opt out. You can no, you can opt out. No, 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 no. You were you were compelled to sweep to Schwab's bank. You opt out by physically writing a trade ticket and buying their right. prime fund or their federal fund. So you actually have to physically make a trade to move money out of the bank. And if you're sure, unwitting, sure, but you, if you still have the option though. It's not. I mean, you're compelled in that it's the default option, but it's not you're not forced into it as the only option. Right? Correct. So I agree. I agree. It's Correct. not easy. It's, it's the default option. But look, I mean, to your point, I think the question that almost gets down to what's the right level of profitability for the broker dealers to take out of the system as the croupier. And so I, in this world, I mean, look, I'm a huge um, anti-advocate for high frequency trading, I guess, in all of its forms. And I have a somewhat of an issue with payment for order flow, which is a different issue we'll get to in a minute. But in this case where you've taken commissions down from almost prohibitively expensive to zero, and the offset to that is you're always going to have some portion of people hold a chunk of their brokerage accounts in cash, right? And they've studied this over many years and many decades. It's been between 9 and 11%, almost without variation in all sorts of cycles. And so if that cash is just sitting there wasting away and they can make money off of that instead of make money off of commissions, you can argue both sides of what's better for consumers, but to me, robbed or immoral is a bridge too far. And in terms of payment for order flow, that to me raises a whole different set of issues where I agree, you don't have a choice of opting out of payment for order flow in most cases, right? It requires a whole other degree of sophistication and effort as opposed to just writing an order ticket and, and taking some control of your own destiny rather than just defaulting to the sweep option. So payment for order flow, which brings in much broader market level uh, debates about what the right structure should be for trading is a whole other issue. I do have a bit of a problem with that, but just saying like, you know, we're sweeping you into our product rather than letting it just sit there. I, I mean, to me, if they were keeping that money and, and being anti-competitive with it, I mean, that would be one argument, but I don't think that's at all what's happening here. Well, I, I mean, in today's world, it's less of an issue. If, we, if we'd had this conversation on on the podcast, um, a year and a half ago, you know, first quarter of 2019, uh, when you had net net interest margins wholly on the sweep. I mean, Schwab's not out making a lot of commercial real estate loans. You know, you know they're buying paper. But at, at the point where that 9 to 11% frictional cash is just sitting in the retail account, you weren't making but, you know, a few basis points, 10 or 20 basis points, 30 basis points. Schwab was keeping the preponderance of that spread. And to me, you know, if you've gone from a world where, you know, if, the, if you had absolute yields and you were entitled to some of that return, they've just made it more difficult for the client to, to earn, I think, what would be a proper rate of return on the cash. Um, compelling into a bank is, I mean, I get why it was done. They were, subs- they were absolutely subsidizing their fund complexes, their money fund complexes. But, you know, buyer beware. And if we ever get back to the point where we actually have real interest rates, it matters a lot. And, you know, another word of caution if you're sitting here today at zero rates and you've got a choice of, of if you want to move out of the bank world and into a money fund, and, and there still are funds that have yield. I mean, I mean, there are still, you know, we, I, we just went through and looked at a whole bunch of money funds um, this morning and in, in thinking about talking about this, this subject. There are still money funds that have absolute yields, but if you can earn 10 or 15 basis points on a, on a, on a federal fund, versus a prime, why would, you, why would you take the credit risk of some of the excesses in, in, in terms of credit that a lot of the money funds reach for yield on if you're going to wind up with the exact same yield simply buying T-bills or, or buying a, a government fund? And so, you know, if you're, the average money market fee now is about one basis point. And if you're going to earn one basis point in a federal fund versus a prime, I'd get yourself out of that prime world because why take the credit risk? Sure, I yeah, totally I've agree. really grappled with this question. I had a position in Schwab for some time. No, you know, no longer sold it uh, earlier this year. Uh, it was you know several years old for us, four plus. Um, and I was struggling with this idea that you know their mission statement is to champion every client's goal with passion and integrity, empowering them to take ownership of their financial future at every income level and life stage. And it's like historically, what's the beauty of Schwab is that they have uh, been disruptive to the industry, driving costs lower and truly empowering consumers. And I viewed that as 
you know, a conflict with their goal of the default election being uh, much lower yield than customers, uh, clients otherwise would get. The flip side of that is I do think the ultimate benefit of driving commissions down and inevitably to, towards zero, like I have a strong opinion on payment for order flow. I actually think it's great. I think it's one of the best things to ever happen for the typical small investor out there. Um, spreads are so small that you won't even ever see a difference between what you, when you put in, effectively, when you put in an order, you're getting that price if you're a small investor. Um, and I think that's phenomenal. And it's kind of inevitably, the whether you're right or wrong on the investment won't have anything to do with the slippage that you experience uh, by someone acquiring that order flow. But you would feel the impact of in a $50,000 account paying $9.99 plus per every trade. Um, so that was you know, truly great, I think. Um, but it's hard to reconcile the two and it's hard to think about the two, uh, especially from an advisor's perspective where you know, we have a fiduciary responsibility to pursue our client's best interest. And you know, I, we, we don't use Schwab. Uh, we use TD and Interactive Brokers. And you know, they do give you some better selections so you could choose some better options beside the default. Um, but yeah, I mean, all of this is out the window when, now that we're back to ZERP. So, you know, I thought about this so much for, for so many years and then here we are back at ZERP. I'd be curious if, if spreads have actually come down. I mean, I, I grew up in a world of eighths and quarters and, you know, I watched the bid ask when we trade today and, you know, we're not a very active trader. So a lot of this discussion doesn't impact our clients to the same degree because our average turnover has been 15% or thereabouts for the last 21, 22 years running, running Semper. But, you know, if, if I'm a Citadel and I can pool orders and take the other side of a trade, I wonder if market liquidity isn't actually lower than it was prior to the move to decimalization. And certainly prior to, you know, Citadel as a market maker, you know, acting as a high frequency trader seeing my order before it's placed on the floor of the exchange. I mean, there are a lot of ways around it. You've got to be pretty sophisticated to get around it. But I'd actually wonder, and I'm sure there's good empirical academic research that would give, give us this answer, and I don't have the answer. But my sense is market liquidity is lower and bid-ass spreads are actually wider. But I, I could be 100% wrong on that. Yeah, the empirical evidence would show bid-ass are quite a bit narrower. But your question about liquidity is a good one because liquidity only matters if it's there when you need it. And that's not something you can always empirically test, uh, certainly not in advance. So I guess my stance on this is there's a lot of nuance in market structure questions like this. There's no black and white answer uh, I would probably fall somewhere in the middle. I don't think payment for order flow is an unambiguously good thing. Um, I think in general, I don't think mandatory sweeps are a terrible thing or, or, a, or an entirely bad thing. Um, I think there's benefits and costs on both sides of it. And in general, if I were running Schwab or Interactive Brokers or anyone else, it would be a very difficult job to try to balance what was good for the business and what was ultimately the right thing to do for customers. Because if you really do screw your customers, you will eventually pay the price. It may take years or decades even, but you know it is a tricky balance. And as a broker, your incentives, something we'll come back to later, are going to always be to generate some level of activity from your customers that you can profit off of. And in most cases, it doesn't really matter what it is. The more trading you do as a retail customer or even an institutional customer, the customer, the worse your returns are going to be. So there's always an inherent conflict. There is certainly an agent principle problem between a broker dealer or a salesperson at those institutions or even the CEO making these strategic decisions and what's best for their customers. And I don't think it is completely black and white in any regard. Yeah, you know, on the spreads, I want to emphasize my point was for the average retail investor, spreads are much smaller. But if you're, a, you know, the more size you're moving, uh, I think spreads are actually a little wider, though it's been like easier and easier to find dark pool uh, sources of liquidity in, in certain names. Um, but that's a really interesting point. And it's something I've thought about a lot, Phil, that you made on the like frequency with which the typical per retail investor trades. And you know, as commissions go lower and lower, it's seemingly easier and more compelling to trade more frequently. 
Right. Um, yet the biggest advantages accrue to those who trade the least, I think. You know, if you're buy and hold and you have a fairly small account, um, your barrier to actually buying a position that you want to sit on and generating, uh, capturing like long term returns is now a lot lower. So uh, I it's don't a know good example of the paradox. Exactly. So if it used to be that the commission was so high that you were afraid or hesitant or wouldn't even make the initial investment, that's bad for you as the customer. But as, as commissions have come down to zero, maybe that gating factor was removed. So you're trading more frequently and actually acting against your own best interests. So it's yes. just a tough circle. I, I can tell you in the early days when I was a kid and with my first brokerage accounts, you know, paying $60 plus 10 cents per share, 12 cents per share or a percentage of the order. You, you had to think, I learned very quickly, you had to think long and hard about whether you're going to transact and you had to be committed to the position you were going to buy because you were shaving off. If you weren't playing around with a lot of dollars and you were paying 60 bucks, you, know, you were shaving off big, big, big percentages. I mean, it would be mid single, high single digits. You know, you'd be giving away half a year or one year's worth of expected return. And so, you know, I learned early on, good Lord, the frictional costs are so high, you really have to be careful about activity. And I, I think you guys are right. The flip side of that is there, there's no perceived cost to trading. So why not, why not day trade? Why not sit in front of your commuter and, and buy and sell and buy and sell? And um, you know, I, I think a lot of return winds up being squandered by manic activity. Well, let's move on to our third topic of the day. Uh, Phil, I know you wanted to update in some way the talk you gave at the Zurich Project a few years ago on uh, the psychology of human misjudgment. Yeah, thanks, John. So I'll make this uh, somewhat brief and then just kind of make it an open-ended discussion that we can hopefully have uh, over ensuing weeks and months. So yeah, I, most of you are hopefully familiar with Charlie Munger's famous talk that he gave, what, now more than 25, almost 30 years ago, I guess, um, 25 years ago. And uh it's just one of the more thought-provoking, impactful things you could ever listen to or read. It's readily available if you just Google it, the psychology of human misjudgment. And so for John's conference in Zurich in 2017, I thought it would be interesting to take some of those examples that he used that were by then quite outdated and just try to update them. And it's sort of become a, a habit or an ongoing thing that I do to make a collection of these sorts of examples because it really helps drive home the principles. And there's 20-something principles, some of which overlap, some of which have been expanded upon by uh, psychologists and business people since then. But it's just a fascinating thing to kind of walk through. And so I thought just occasionally as things pop up that, that catch my attention, I would take that opportunity to highlight those uh, individual concepts because it's just such a great way to learn them over time. And the first one, this is something we were getting to just a minute ago, is the power of incentives and how absolutely crucial it is in driving all sorts of business behavior. And in this case, in broker dealers, um, which is really a you know can entail a bit of circular logic, and it gets pretty difficult. And in the original case, it was Charlie Munger talking about how um, when FedEx was trying to get up and running with its centralized uh, sorting facility in Memphis every night, they couldn't find a the way to get the thing to work. So they were trying to, you know, basically browbeat or incentivize their employees to get all the packages shipped and sent back out in one shift overnight. And what finally flipped the switch was instead of paying people by the hour, they paid them by the shift. So that if they were, you know, not done by four or five or six in the morning, they had to stay and keep working and in if they were for the same pay rather than getting more pay, obviously. So uh, the examples I used in 2007 uh, or sorry, 2017 to update it were Wells Fargo and the scandal that um, has continued to really drag the company down, whereby some really bizarre and ultimately unprofitable and immaterial behavior driven by incentives to meet sales quotas at the retail level um, really created a massive problem for the company. Uh, likewise, at Valiant, where you know some really interesting, uh, more corporate level incentives created a huge scandal. And I think today, I mean, you've seen, I mean, probably the single most um, stark example I've seen since that talk uh, emerged a couple of years ago at Boeing with the 737 MAX problem, where you just had a Lollapalooza of effects come together. But I think at the base of it, it was really just an incentives problem. So Airbus had come out with a, with a new plane that was extremely successful and a direct threat to the 737. And this strong clear black and white incentive that Boeing had was to come out with an updated rival product that did not require any additional training. And so I don't ascribe any malice or any wrongdoing 
or any evil intent on Boeing's part at all. I think it was a genuine mistake and screw up in a very complex environment that was poorly handled and poorly managed. But at the very base of it, it was all about incentives. They were just trying to get a product to market as quickly as possible that didn't require additional training. And in doing so, all sorts of things went wrong and all hell broke loose. And you can see um, the very stark results of that. Another one that ties back into our conversation last week with uh, Larry Cunningham is around disclosure and investor relations practices. So again, I think if you look at the fall of GE, and we were just talking about the fall from Grace as several companies removed from the Dow, and, and you know how far GE has fallen in the regard of public uh, markets, you know GE for many many years and many decades put out very precise quarterly earnings per share guidance which I think we would all hopefully agree is not an ideal metric to either track or guide to or incentivize to. But that was very strongly at the core of everything that GE did. And in my opinion, it was largely responsible for a lot of the financial mismanagement, um, even going back into Jack Welch's ten- tenure that really ruined the company. Um, so it, it, it again highlights how incentives may not seem like a big thing in a given day, a given week, a given year, even a given decade in this case, but over time can have just absolutely disastrous results. Other examples of it in that realm uh, for me include adjusted earnings and adjusted metrics where the very strong incentive you have is to report only numbers that flatter the company and only make you look good. And it allows you to kind of sweep everything else under the rug and allow those problems to accumulate until disaster happens in a big way at the end. Uh, likewise, stock-based compensation, um, something that you know continues to fester, continues to be kind of this bizarro world where logic and reason and common sense accounting don't apply. If you're getting paid a lot of your comp in, in stock, what are your incentives to do? Um, your incentives are very, very strongly to do whatever it takes to get the stock to a certain level or a certain price at a certain time, a certain point in time not to maximize the value of the company in the right direction over longer periods of time. So uh, I thought I would start with that and just throw it out there. And then I hope to make this kind of a, an open-ended discussion and we can solicit ideas. I'm going to keep a running list of for each topic that we have. Uh, hopefully, Chris and Elliot and John can chime in with maybe a few examples if they have any. Uh, you're welcome to send me examples via email or Twitter as to things. And then um, as we go, I will update this document. I'm sure John can put the original document in the in the show notes. And then as we get more good examples that are current for 2020 and beyond, we'll, uh, we'll update the document and, and share it publicly. Yeah, I mean, this is such a fascinating topic. I mean, all of us have kind of had exposure to each of these conversations and each of these uh, examples that you shared. You know, Wells Fargo is one I've thought about so much. It's like incentives. And yet the the most important asset for a bank in a lot of ways is the trust of your customers. So like you would think their incentives go toward protecting that at all costs. And how does that get lost along the way, right? They take a sterling reputation and ruin it quite fast. Um Boeing, I don't know. I'm not quite as sanguine on thinking about how their incentives uh, played out there, right? I, I, I mean, I guess I don't have direct exposure to the story, but I've read a lot about the culture and how the culture changed after the McDonnell Douglas acquisition. And it was far more like a bottom line oriented culture. Um, and so they kind of cut their cost way to less investment and less care for some of the safety side of things. I don't know. It's tough to tough to say, tough to wrap my head around. Um, trying to brainstorm some further examples of where these kinds of things have gone wrong. Um, and I know hey, I'm sure I could come up with a, bu- with a few more, but these ones I've thought about a lot and it's like mind-blowing how it could actually happen with, with our blue chips. Yeah. And my point on Boeing, by the way, is not to absolve the company in any way, shape or form. It's, it, likewise with Wells Fargo. I think if I could summarize it more succinctly, it would be that if you underweight the importance of incentives, or if you get some seemingly minor thing wrong in creating the incentives within your organization, you probably won't notice it right away, but it will very likely end up playing a leading role in a major disaster at (laughs) some point down the road. Such a strong point. Well, Phil, I'm glad you brought up the, the the speech and pulled it up last night. If everybody's not read it, it's it's a must read. I mean, Mr. Munger took over the course of a period of years three very academic uh, textbooks and essentially boiled it all down to Phil's list of twenty or twenty five or so thematical areas. And so you do a 
complete survey of psychology uh, simply by reading a 27 or 28 page uh, page speech by Charlie. And I, and I scrolled through the list last night when you mentioned that, that you might talk about this. And you know, the one that's always jumped out at me is his, his inconsistency avoidance tendency, which is really just anchoring or just at, at, at bottom, the avoidance of change. And there are great examples for any of these 20, 25 uh, kind of tendencies on the list. But this one in particular is, is so much corporate behavior, so much investment behavior is, is, is just set in stone. And you know, I talked about Exxon a few minutes ago in terms of being booted out of the Dow Jones Industrials. You know, we own Exxon, and I've got another investment position in, in a company called Olin, which is actually headquartered here in St. Louis. Really well-run chemical business that, that effectively picked up the chloroalkali and the vinyls and the epoxy business from Dow DuPont when they were merging and really had to sell that business to avoid antitrust. So I've got two businesses, though, that are very cyclical, that are really you know, suffering mightily from the downturn. Uh, in Exxon's case, obviously in energy prices, very few of their, of their diversified businesses from refining to chemicals have been performing well. The, a third drop in industrial production has harmed the business. Olin, with a lot of in markets with industrial uses, you know, thriving in pulp and paper, but all their auto related, you know, businesses are, are weak and, you know, go through the list. But the point being, you're sitting here with operationally and financially leveraged businesses in both cases and companies that are hitched to being dividend aristocrats. And I've got two companies that are not earning uh, their dividend, they're not earning their CapEx. Uh, in fact, on a gap basis, you know, both for a period are losing money and neither have come off uh, the payment of their dividends. And, you know, they've both got decades and decades and decades of adhering to their dividend policy. And it's just crazy. And it goes to Charlie's inconsistency avoidance tendency. It's, it's, it's this notion we've always paid it. We think our shareholders want it. They demand it. Well, they don't even know who their shareholders are. Their shareholders are ephemeral, ephemeral and fleeting. And to me, if you're a cyclical business with, with both layers of leverage, you ought to have dividend policy and a capital policy that kind of matches the profitability of the cycle. And to me, it's, it's just abhorrent to have to borrow money to finance the dividend in the depths of a really deep recession. But you know, aside from that, again, if you haven't read, if you haven't read the speech, it's, it's in Poor Charlie's Almanac, and I know you can find it online. It's uh, probably one of the most useful tools to go through and go through the list and you can come up with great examples as Phil has done so so marvelously on examples for each of these you know, kind of great tenets from the the non-academic side of psychology. And likewise, it actually was, uh, it was, he gave a big shout out in the book to Bob Cialdini's book, Influence, which had, the psychology of persuasion, which had come out somewhat recently when the original talk was given. But this, this speech was well before uh, Kahneman and Tversky had come into the mainstream. They'd done a lot of their pioneering work, but thinking fast and slow was still, you know, 20 years off at that point. Um, and I had uh, the, the pleasure of getting Jason Zweig, who actually helped the, the great Wall Street Journal uh, reporter and writer uh, and author who helped Kahneman write Thinking Fast and Slow. Uh, most people, I don't think, really appreciate that unless they've dug into the notes or read some of Zweig's comments on it. But I got him to comment on what I tried to do when I updated this in 2017, and uh, I, with his permission, I shared it in the in the paper I sent then, and, and I'll share his comments now. It says, it seems clear to me that I've been wrong for many years in saying that the single greatest challenge for investors is to develop self-control. In fact, the single greatest challenge investors face is to see ourselves as we actually are. What makes Warren Buffett and perhaps even more Charlie Munger so remarkable is how honest they are about themselves with themselves. And I thought that was just, I mean, again, Jason Zweig is phenomenal. I thought that was just very well put on his part. And he just said that off the cuff in an email to me, but these are the kind of thoughts that he has. And I thought, wow, that is an exceptional way of putting it. And that's why I've made, tried to make such an intentional effort in this regard is that the more examples I can find of this, the more I can hammer it into my own head as to how these things matter and where I'm getting it wrong and the mistakes I'm making in line with these principles because they're just insidious and they're everywhere you look once you actually start looking for them. 
Yeah, I think one of the ultimate examples that come to mind thinking from a uh, portfolio manager and investment perspective, uh, some of the early uh, successful longs in Valiant on the way up, uh, like Value Act and Sequoia, who like really identified the right thesis, but they got wooed into, I don't know, an obsession and a love for the business that that kind of blinded them to any problems, even as they were really coming out one after the other. Um, that's one of the ones I, I definitely think about and think is one of those lessons better to learn by watching someone else than myself fall victim to it. But it's you know definitely one of the things I think about a lot too, like how you're predisposed to like something more that you own as it works, especially if it doesn't seemingly untether from certain core valuation metrics, but like it, it, how dangerous can that be in certain cases? That's one I'd throw out there. Yeah, I'll give you another one too, and then I'll, I'll stop beating a dead horse. But there's a story in the news just the other day that I will try to criticize by category <laughs> rather than by name. But um, for anyone who's read it, you'll know what I'm talking about. There's a somewhat prominent energy-related company that filed for bankruptcy this summer. Um, and in that company, the board had signed off on multi-million dollar bonuses for the executives uh, five days before the company filed bankruptcy. And when you peeled it back even further, there had been multiple levels of, uh, I don't want to call it insider dealing. It may or may not have gone quite that far, but some very aggressive uh, intercompany sales and related party transactions with the CEO and some other insiders. And it turned out that the three-person um independent committee of board members that was signing off on these deals and these bonuses um, was led by the CFO of the university from which the CEO had graduated and to which the CEO was a major donor. A pretty obvious incentive-driven conflict of interest, and it resulted in a pretty big disaster. I mean, it may not have any long-term repercussions for anyone involved. I mean, unfortunately, you can get quite cynical in this regard, but just an obvious case of incentives gone wrong. And uh, I, again, I think it's just amazing. You could probably open up the the Wall Street Journal on an almost daily or weekly basis and find stuff like that. It's just fascinating. Um, maybe just a thought on, uh, since we're talking incentives, um, I'm hearing a lot these days about culture and the importance of culture. And I don't know what the question is really here, but it seems like incentives and culture is not exactly the same thing, that sometimes maybe you cannot guide all action by incentives. So how do you guys think about uh, that dichotomy or how culture and incentives can complement each other perhaps to create a company that's going to actually do all the right things? Yeah, that's a great question. It's something I wish we'd gotten to last week with Larry Cunningham about Constellation because they use cash where a big chunk of it has to be invested in in the stock as a primary incentive tool rather than options or rather than restricted stock grants. And it's an interesting practice. It's not perfect as nothing is, but it's a it's an interesting one. I, I will say, I think you're exactly right. Incentives and culture are definitely not the same thing. And the best companies in the world, any of them that I've ever looked at have a combination of the two, but they are distinct. And I think most companies have a culture whereby financial compensation and incentives are not the end-all be-all. I think where financial compensation and incentives take an outsized role, you tend to get some really bad results. And in most companies where really great things and great progress happens over time, there's some element of culture where people feel like they're a part of a team that's serving a greater good whether that's lowering the cost to their consumer, providing new avenues of growth and advancement for the economy and humanity. There's some sort of, we're all in this together, almost a David versus Goliath, we're out to beat the world kind of thing that is central to most great cultures at most great companies. And that has really a separate question from incentives. I think you're right, Phil, though. Incentives and culture go absolutely hand in hand and, and one can drive the other and the other can drive the other. But you never find great companies where they don't have both. Um, you spend enough time in proxy statements over the years, and you really see what works and what doesn't work. If you're incentivized by asinine metrics, you know revenue growth or adjusted EBITDA or all kinds of things that don't drill down to some level of return on equity or return on capital, return on assets, it's just insane. Um, you think about the current run up in Tesla. And, you know, Elon Musk's motivation is to get the stock price up, and and that's it. Um, you know, he's was awarded the twenty million or so option shares a couple of years ago, and 
they vest in increments of, I want to say, 12 tranches. And it's largely driven by A, revenue growth, but also by achieving some average level of market capitalization over 60-day rolling periods. And so you can do all kinds of crazy things that really have no impact on long-term profitability that's very much going to drive Elon's pocketbook. And you just go go through the gamut of businesses. And unfortunately, you know, the businesses that have great incentives and uh, great cultures are few and far between. And I, to your point, when, when I found them, they always tend to go hand in hand and you, you just don't have one without the other. Totally agree. Yeah, that's an interesting point on the uh, Tesla situation too, because like, obviously you want management teams who are incented to uh, do well for their company and a stock that follows. And in theory, over the long term, a rising stock price is the reward for good results. But if you tie the incentive purely to stock price, that creates all sorts of, I don't know, call it perverse incentives along the way. Um, so to find like purity in incentive structure is also challenging. Like you could find the right incentives. Um, you could find the right things to tie it to, but it's really, you know, wh- which parts of it do you want to reward? Um, and I've seen a few companies try to take better efforts at it um, more recently. And, you know, I think it's a big part of why I've tended to flock toward companies who are owner operators. And I know a lot of people share the same perspective in the active management world, but I do think that's inevitably the ultimate incentive to to kind of share your interest as a shareholder first, as opposed to exposing yourself to the agency problem. You know, I, don't, I don't have a problem at all, a little bit off point, but I don't have a problem at all with, with management teams making very large amounts of money, obscenely large amounts of money. Um, but, but if you get the right incentives on how they get there, that, that's the all important thing. And I've talked, John, when I was with you at Zurich a couple of years ago, uh, I guess last summer, uh, I talked about comments and the way the management there is compensated. It's all very much return on equity and asset driven. The CEO, Tom Leinbarger, makes a bunch of money. Uh, the majority of compensation comes from performance shares and, and you know vesting schedules that are tied toward the profitability of the business. And for that, you see really good blocking and tackling out of the day-to-day operations of the business. And that compensation structure flows all the way downward to the highly compensated executives, to the way the division heads are operated or are, are incentivized. And man, you get that incentive thing right. And it's just a it's just a glorious thing. And very few get it right. Um, so you know, the, the the proxy is often very telling. I mean, you know, it, it's it, it's good to find them when they're good, but it's so apparently obvious when you find them when they're bad. And those just tend to be enough of a red flag to avoid the business altogether. Exactly. So maybe we just avoid <laughs> avoid all the potential future disasters by just opting out when you see the the red flags and the bad incentives, right? If you can. Sometimes they're hidden. I mean, it's not obvious in a lot of cases, but... Along these lines, one uh, guy that I've loved following on Twitter is uh, at NonGap. Um, and Mike has a great uh, sub stack. And he's written this four-part series on profiting, profiting from corporate governance, uh, the dark arts. He looks at the dark arts of corporate governance in situations where companies seemingly uh, internally know that certain events or catalysts are coming up and use um, their comp incentive structure to, in, in effect, when you're screening for these things and looking for them closely, signal that events are going to happen, but really to, to kind of accrue excess compensation in themselves. So it's kind of interesting that you could play both sides of these things. Um, you know, on the one hand, look for companies with the ultimate incentive structures to just hang in there for the long run. On the other hand, look for companies that are abusing the fact that there are some of these misincentives to try to capitalize upon um, and, and take positions accordingly. So uh, sorry, that kind of a tangent, but I think relevant and it's interesting to think about. It reminds me a little bit, Elliot, of um, I think a Greenblatt uh, lecture on spinoffs and where you could essentially buy a spinoff right before the management's kind of comp thing goes into effect where until that uh, point in time, they're going to basically talk down the stock or not communicate or what have you in hopes that the stock goes down. And then when their options are struck, um, 
you know, they're going to actually go out with an IR effort and so forth. And that's a little bit of way to play that game uh, as an investor where you would uh, essentially do what the insiders are doing, which is trying to buy the stock close to where their options are struck. Yeah, it's really not too different from like kitchen sinking in general, right? This whole idea that you want to set the bar as low as possible when you know there's a pot of gold on the other side of the rainbow for yourself. Um, so watching and being a keen observer uh, on both sides for looking for good opportunities to you know invest for the long run and kind of these shorter term opportunities. And by the way, I'm no uh, master of this, so I'm just learning and trying to understand and you know really have always, but really trying to enhance my effort on understanding the incentive structures of these companies and thinking about this. But yeah, spinoffs are one of those opportunities where where that really exists and try to try to hunt around for those and look for look for good ones. Though they haven't quite worked as well in recent times, but PayPal has been, been a fun one for me. Okay. Well, uh, I think we'll leave it there. Uh, Phil, I think the um, psychology of human misjudgment is something that can provide fodder for us for years and decades to come. So uh, fear <laughs> not, we will have uh, material to discuss on this podcast. <laughs> It'll be a fun recurring theme. Thank you guys so much. Talk to you next week. And thanks thanks guys. to everyone for listening. Have a good Goodbye one. Bye for now. Thank you for listening to This Week in Intelligent Investing, brought to you exclusively by MOI Global, the research-driven membership organization. Learn more at moiglobal.com.